بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters and friends I pray you all well so it's sad news it's the final talk of the series of three talks that have been fortunate enough and blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to deliver and it's not that sad because inshallah I'll be back because I've had some amazing experiences in this amazing country of Oman with its amazing people, with its amazing heritage, with its amazing collective consciousness of humility, of good etiquette, of optimal characteristics such as compassion and being at service to people. And as I said before, I think the people of Oman are a beacon of light for the region and for the rest of the world. And it reminds me of the hadith, the prophetic tradition of the Prophet وسلم, And he basically told us that there is khair in the ummah. And there's definitely khair here. So may Allah bless every single one of you. There's goodness here. So today's talk is on the divine reality. Why atheism is unnatural and irrational. I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine that my friend David gives me a call. I haven't spoken to David for around 30 years. And we used to go to school together. And I'm a bit reluctant to pick up the call because David, he was a funny guy. And we all have those funny guys at school, right? And I'm thinking, should I pick it up or not? Look, it's been such a long time. Let me just see. Let me just pick it up. Maybe he's changed. Maybe there's a transformation. So I pick up the phone. Hello? Assalamu alaikum. Kaifa hal? Mu'alum, mu'akhbar. Kaifa al ahl? Kaifa jama'a? Kaifa mahaliya? Kaifa siyara? You know the way you treat each other, yeah? Alhamdulillah. So. By the way, which is amazing, the greetings that the Omanis give each other, it just gives you so much joy. And literally, it just, it's just so much joy. Alhamdulillah. You even ask about your cows and your camels, it's fantastic. <laughs> so, I pick up the phone and David says, Hey Hamza, how's it going? It's been what? Nearly 30 years or something? Anyway, we have a conversation. He says, meet me tomorrow. We're going to have lunch. No problem. Free lunch. I'm coming. So I close the phone and we're having lunch. So fast forward around 24 hours. I'm sitting down. I'm having a gourmet meal. Very nice, right? So I'm speaking to him. And we're having a very decent conversation. There's nothing kind of controversial. He's not, you know, making it difficult. It's an easy, nice conversation. But then the dessert comes. <laughs> and that's when the sugar rush hits, right? That's what happens to me sometimes. When I have sugar, I'm like a drunk guy. So it's advisable that I don't have sugar. So the dessert comes and he comes close to me and says, Look, Hamza, I really brought you here because I need to tell you a truth. I'm like, oh my God, here we go again. I thought you changed. You used to be like this 30 years ago in science class. You used to say silly things. Anyway, so I'm listening to him. He says, Hamza, the universe and everything in it began five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, would you believe it? Would you believe it? People are crazy. Wallah. Right? So he said, the universe began five minutes ago. You have to believe me. This is the truth. This is the haq. Right? So I want to stop the scenario here and then end it with two possible endings. Are you ready? So here's the first possible ending. I'm sitting there, I'm listening to him and I'm basically saying, you know what, David, you're wrong. It's impossible the universe started five minutes ago because I'm 42 years old I was born in 1990. I have photos of me in the 80s and 90s. I have memories that are longer than five minutes. 
I know other people that have memories longer than five minutes. I see and know people that are older than me. We have history books going back hundreds of years. We have history referring to thousands of years. We have artifacts, carbon dating. This is all wrong. So that's the first scenario. You ready? Ready for the second scenario? Second scenario is, I say to David, okay, that's very interesting. What's your, where's your evidence? Which scenario is more rational? Wait, I want you to think about this. Which scenario is more rational? Which response? Which conclusion? conclusion? The first one or the second one? Can't hear you. The second one. Limada. Why? I know that. But the first scenario gives evidence too. But you're giving evidence for your position. But the second scenario, you're asking evidence for his position. Why is that the most rational? Why is the second scenario more rational? He posed the scenario good. So you would argue the onus of proof is on him? Yes. But, this, but why? There's something else there as well. Yes. Ahsan, Sheikh. Allahu Akbar. It's against the default position. Because the second scenario is more rational because you are questioning him because David has gone against a self-evident truth. And the one who goes against a self-evident truth, the onus of proof is on them, not on you. And a self-evident truth is a truth that is true by default. We're not saying it may not change. It might change. But it's true by default. Is this clear? So you don't have to start proving, well, you know, I have an appreciation of the psycholo psychological depth of time, the temporal depth of time. I, I have memories that go beyond five minutes for sure. I have history books. You don't have to prove that. He has to prove it. Now he may be right. It could be the case that universe started five minutes ago, but it started five minutes ago with all of you guys having these memories of more than, I don't know. How old are you, Sheikh? 25 years. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. It must be the dates in Oman, Allahu Akbar. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? It could be, but it's not the default position. It's not the thing that is true by default. And I'm not making this concept up. We have this idea of basic truths, first principles, self-evident truths, basic philosophical assumptions. This exists in every domain of knowledge. Even science, take science as an example. For science to work, it requires a philosophical assumption. Generally speaking, you need to be believe in a real world that's external to your mind, that has external causal connections. But in philosophy, there is a healthy debate on realism or idealism. Is it out there or is it in here? There's a healthy debate on what is the nature of the causal link? Oh, until the, the Bosch and the Kosh come home, yeah? As we say, the cows come home. You could have this debate until the cows come home. There's a discussion on this stuff. But the scientific community and the philosophers of science, generally speaking, would accept it as a first principle, a needed philosophical assumption, a basic truth, a self-evident truth, in order for that domain of knowledge to grow and progress. Pick any domain of knowledge, any, and you have an assumption or a first principle. Just think of one. Think of any domain of knowledge, and you would have an assumption, a philosophical assumption, a first principle, a basic truth, a self-evident truth. Now, I'm not here to unpack the philosophical nuances between all of these things, but the point is very simple. You adopt certain positions that you don't necessarily prove but they're needed in order for that domain of knowledge to grow. Is this clear? Good. So my thesis today is to show that atheism 
or atheists are like David. <laughs> They're going against the self-evident truth. They're going against the self-evident truth. Yeah, yeah, she's trying, she's trying. He said it might be a new phone, and, you know, she doesn't know how to use it. And, you know, just give her some husn of van, yeah? Some benefit of the doubt. <laughs> so, atheists are like David. What are they postulating when they say there is no God? They're going against the self-evident truth. They're going against a self-evident truth. A truth that is true by default. And when someone goes against the self-evident truth, the onus of proof is on them. So I'm not saying we don't have evidence. We have plenty of the theological, philosophical, fitri, innate evidence to show that God exists, for sure. But the reason I'm mentioning this is to show that their position is unnatural, it's not intuitive, and that we don't have to do the defending. They have something to defend. We need to take the intellectual ground, the center of the ring. I like boxing, right? And a good boxer takes the center of the ring, right? He's not on the ropes, unless he's very good, yeah? Like Muhammad Ali, you know, is very defensive. But the point is, generally speaking, you take the center of the ring. And you're trying to push them back. That's what I'm trying to say here. here. The atheist should not request evidence as a default point of the discussion, we should say to them, where's your evidence? This doesn't mean we don't have evidence, by the way. So, why am I claiming that the atheist position is like David? The atheist position is denying a self-evident truth. Well, let's look at the nature of self-evident truths. Let's look at the features. By the way, these are features, not criteria. Because if there's criteria, then they're really not self-evident truths anymore. These are features. We know they're self-evident truths, and we see certain features of self-evident truths. So, some features of self-evident truth include the following. Number one, it is universal. What do I mean by universal? What I mean by universal is that it is not the product of a specific set of social circumstances or a specific group of people. It doesn't mean there is a consensus. We're not saying it has to be a majority. Universality here means it's not the product of particular social or biological conditions. For example, believing that the past exists, the universe is older than five minutes ago, Believing in the past existing is not the product of just Omanis. Oma it didn't come from the Omani social biological conditions. It's not the product just of the Kenyans or the Chinese or the British. It's universal in that it transcends specific cultural, social and biological conditions. Is this clear? So the self-evident truth of the past being real that the past is older than five minutes, that the past exists, is a self-evident truth. And that self-evident truth doesn't necessarily have to have everyone agreeing with it, but that it's universal from the point of view that it's not based on social, biological circumstances of a specific group. Is this clear? So self-evident truths are universal. Number two, they are untaught. You don't learn self-evident truths. And what do I mean by learn here? Let's be careful. That someone external to you taught it to you. I don't remember any time at school when a teacher said to me, Hamza, time is real. What happened yesterday is real. The universe didn't just begin five minutes ago. Last week was real. Two weeks ago was real. You, you're never taught that. Never but you understand it through your introspections, through your experience with the real world. So it's untaught from the point of view, there's nothing external to you that teaches this to you. Clear? So time being real, the past being real, the universe not being created five minutes ago is untaught. Third and final feature. 
It is natural and intuitive. What does this mean? This means this belief, this idea, this concept, this self-evident truth, this thing that is true by default is the product of a functioning psyche, right? You have your cognitive and psychological functions as normal. Also, it means that it is the most simplest and comprehensive idea explaining a particular phenomenon. For example, we have the concept of time, the past, the present, and the future. If someone says to you, the universe began five minutes ago, there is no past beyond that. There is no past beyond that. That's not an adequate explanation of reality. Because what does reality say? I have memories, you have memories. I have an age, you have an age. And it's more than five minutes ago. We have historical objects. We have the psychological appreciation of time, temporal depth, and so on and so forth. So that postulation that the universe was created five minutes ago, there is no time beyond that, doesn't make sense comprehensively of the data. Clear? Good. So one would argue time being real in terms of there was a past beyond five minutes makes sense of our appreciation of the temporal depth of time, makes sense of our memories, makes sense of our experiences, makes sense of the grey beards in front of me, right? They didn't get those grey beards five minutes ago, that's for sure. So do you see the point? So these are the features of self-evident truth. You could apply this to any self-evident truth. You would see these features when you point out something and say, this is a self-evident truth. For example, one would argue, notwithstanding the theological debate on idealism and, and realism, from a popular level and even from a perspective of science and the philosophy of science, Believing that there is an external world, external to your mind, is a self-evident truth. It's true by default. I'm not saying you can't challenge it. I'm not saying you can't have a discussion. But it's true by default. And let's see, does it have the features of what we just discussed? Number one, it's universal. Absolutely. You go to Kenya, let's say the world is real. Right? And if you say, if you say it's not real, then you may get a slap. Yeah? <laughs> right? Your imama is external to your mind. Your sandals are external to your mind. The wall is external to your mind. People in Oman appreciate there is an external world. It's not just in here. People in China, people in Britain. It's not the product of a specific social biological circumstances. So it's universal. Number two, it's untaught. When was the last time someone taught you at school? You know your jacket, this is not in your brain, it's on your body in the outside external real world. You know that person there and that person there, they exist outside of you, they're not inside of your head. You're not in the metaverse, not yet anyway, yeah? <laughs> so do you understand the point? So it's untaught. Third point, it's natural and intuitive. It's the product of a functioning psyche. And it's the simplest and comprehensive explanation of the data. What's the data? I'm touching and feeling things. They seem to be outside my mind. I can see things external to me in some sense. If I say no, it's all just in my head, I've got more work to do. I have to now answer more questions such as, well, how do I explain these feelings? How do I explain the objects that I touch? How do I explain things that I see? How do I explain other people's perception that there is an external world? So you've got more explaining to do. It's not comprehensive. It raises more problems than it solves. So this was another self-evident truth with the same features. Untaught, universal, natural and intuitive. Clear? All right. So how do we make sense of God then? By the way, and when we're talking about God here, we're talking about his creative agency. Al-Khaliq. He is the creator. We're not talking about his Al-Rahman, Al-Wudud, Al-Rahim, Al-Hakim, Al-Alim, the wise, the knowing, the loving, and so on and so forth. Well, that's, you need revelation for that. God announces himself to mankind. We're talking about the aspect that God is a creator. There is a creator for things. The underlying basic concept 
of a creator. When there is a painting, you know there's a painter. When there is a gardener, garden that's been arranged nicely, there is a gardener, and so on and so forth. This is what we're talking about. When there is a building, there is a builder. When there is a cake, there is a baker. Do you see my point? The underlying basic concept of prior causal connections or prior causal conditions or a prior cause or a prior creator. This is what we're talking about. Because that is fundamentally the underlying basis of Al-Khaliq, the creator creating the universe. Make sense? So let's, uh, let's see if the features exist with regards to the Creator. Number one, it's universal. Absolutely, go anywhere in the world and you'll see that people would say there was a Creator that created the universe. And this self-evident truth is not based on the specific social biological conditions. Yes, 50% of Germany may be atheist, ma majority of China may be atheist, that's irrelevant. We're not saying universality means consensus. We're saying universality means it's not the product of a specific social biological conditions. So the belief in the creator is universal. Two more left. It's untaught. I never went to school and my teacher had to teach me that when there's a painting, there requires a painter. When there is a building, it requires a builder. When there is a Carved piece of wood, it requires a carpenter or wood sculptor, whatever you call it, right? When there is a statue, there is a sculptor and so on and so forth. And then when you ask a child that hasn't been infected by social biological conditions and you say painting requires a painter, sculptor, a scu uh, 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 what do you call that thing? Statue requires a sculptor and so on and so forth. Then you say, the universe had some kind of creator. You don't learn that concept that is the basis for that answer external to yourself. You learn it introspectively as a child as you're growing up. And that's why some, I think, anthropologists or uh, psychologists of religion, religion would argue that if you put children on a, on a desert island, they're going to believe in a creator. And even there is some studies, and obviously these studies are dhanni, they're speculative because they have their own assumptions, certain methodologies, but there are some studies, and there is conflicting data, so we put a, we, we sprinkle a bit of salt on it, right? You take it with a pinch of salt, rather. That even children that come from atheistic families, they still have this idea of a creator for the universe, and this idea of God. So, it's untaught. Third and final point, it's natural and intuitive. Obviously, the idea that things require a prior creator, prior causal conditions, painter, painting requires a painter, a cake requires a baker, a statue requires a sculptor, and so on and so forth. The universe requires a creator. This is the product of a functioning psyche. Yeah? Also, it's the intuitive, it's the most simple and comprehensive explanation for things that have emerged in some kind of complex way. A pa painting. No child or even a an atheist is going to say the painting just appeared. No one will do that. When they see an amazing statue, they're not going to say, hey, the statue was, you know, it was a gust of wind. Right? When they go to a garden, they see an arrangement of flowers that says, I love muscat. Right? They're not going to say, hey, that was just a... Uh, a camel breathing and the flowers are somehow just came together. It's, that's an irrational postulation. Similarly with the whole universe and its systems and the systems in the universe itself, the galaxies, the intricate nature of things, the world, the earth, the interconnecting principles of nature, the principles of biology within this micro universe, the human being, and the macro universe, the universe outside, all of this intricacy and apparent design is best explained by a creator. It answers most of the questions. It doesn't create far more problems than it solves. So it's intuitive, it's comprehensive as an explanation. But if you say there was no creator, then you got a problem. You have the problem of inconsistency. Painting, painter. 
building builder, baked cake baker, statue sculptor, universe nothing. <laughs> There's an inconsistency. There's an inconsistency. And then nothing, you need now try and explain that the universe somehow came from nothing. It creates far more problems than it solves. Because conceptually, from nothing, nothing comes. If you have nothing, and you wait a lot of time, and nothing by definition is the absence of anything. No prior causal conditions, no properties. So if you have an eternal infinite nothing, with no properties, no prior causal conditions, no potential, no thing at all, how on earth can you say that anything came from that? Wallahi, to even dare to postulate such a thing, you have to be irrational. Totally irrational. Totally irrational. And I make a joke sometimes. I make a scenario with Richard Dawkins, yeah? And, you know, I pretend to be his bank manager. And I call Richard Dawkins. I say, Richard Dawkins, you know all that money that you made, the millions that you made from writing your fiction? <laughs> it is fiction, some of it, isn't it, yeah? If you deny God, it's a fiction book. So, you know, all, all that money, uh, it's, uh, it's gone. Khalas, it's just disappeared. People are like, hey, how dare you? I need an explanation. It's irrational that it just disappeared without any prior causal conditions, without any reason, without any cause. Well, if you believe the universe came from nothing, then your money could disappear into nothing too. Right? Be consistent. What's wrong with you? Be consistent. And that is the nature of kufr, denying the truth. It will always contradict, always contradict itself. It will always contradict itself. So, what we've just shown here is that the idea, the basic underlying concept of a creator is a self-evident truth. Now, one would argue, but Hamza, isn't atheism a self-evident truth as well? Because atheism is universal. It's not the product of a specific social biological condition. So that means it's a universal truth. It's a self-evident truth. No. We said the principles or the features rather of a self-evident truth is that it's universal. It doesn't come from specific social biological conditions. Num number two, it is untaught. One would argue that atheism is actually taught to children. But even if we give them that, say it's not taught, they've got the third one that they can't do, that, that, that's, that's not a feature of atheism, which is it's not intuitive it's not the most simple and most comprehensive explanation of reality remember you have to have all three so from this perspective i've shown i think quite confidently that the underlying basic idea of a creator is self-evidently true it's true by default since it's true by default i'm not going to start the argument you need to prove your position and this is the position of the quran and unfortunately in the dawah sharing islam we always go first with the attack thinking we got something to prove where in the Qur'an do you find a direct, explicit argument for the existence of God? Very rare. Almost unknown. Almost unseen. Because Allah already placed it in you through His justice and mercy. It's in your fitrah. It's in your innate disposition. Every child, the Prophet ﷺ said, is born in a state of fitrah. Fatara, fatrun, fatarahu. Something has been created within you to acknowledge Allah. It's within us, it's part of us, but we cloud it based on socialization, parenting, sins, whatever. The point is we cloud the fitrah so that light is not shining through. The light of truth, the light of haq. And this is something that we need to understand because the Quran, maybe in one or two places is an explicit reference to proving that there is a creator for things. Chapter 52, verses 35 to 36. Did you come from nothing? Did you create yourself? Did you create the heavens and the earth? Indeed, you don't have any certainty. That's a very powerful argument for God's existence. It's called the Quranic argument for God's existence. We can unpack it. But the point is, that's one out of many, many verses. Most of the verses are, if you ask the Arabs, who created the heavens and the earth, they're going to say, Allah it's intuitive. The Qur'an focuses on a very fundamental question, which is, who is worthy of worship? Not who created the universe. And when Allah refers to His creative agency, 
it's as a reminder to affirm a premise in order for you to conclude Allah is worthy of my love, Allah is worthy of my obedience, Allah is worthy for us to single out and direct all acts of worship to Him alone. That's the strategy in the Quran. Don't get me wrong, there are secondary and tertiary functions of these ayat which you can say gives you an argument for God's existence but it's not prima facie meaning it's not the obvious primary reading of the verses it's there you can unpack it no problem but generally speaking as a prima facie reading of the Quran the Quran assumes that everybody has this inside them or assumes that everybody it's so obvious it's so obvious that there's a creator of the heavens and the earth and I think sometimes giving it an intellectual platform diminishes the tradition. Don't get me wrong, I've had debates with atheists, you know, all around the world, no problem. We're about intellectual discourse and discussion, but, you know, thinking about it, sometimes we overemphasize this. And I think we need to turn the tables, take the center of the intellectual ring and say, hey, where's your evidence? You don't have any evidence? Good, shush, let's move on, right? So from this perspective, atheism is unnatural. So that's the first part of today. Done? Second part, atheism is irrational. <laughs> now, atheism is irrational for so many different reasons. I mean, we could pick a few, but let's pick one for now. Which one should we pick? All right, so. What's one plus one? Good, thank you. <laughs> What's five plus five? Ten. What's ten plus ten? Very good, okay. Conclude this for me, number one. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Number two, the universe began to exist. Number three, therefore the universe has a cause. Good, so you've concluded. This is what you call a necessary conclusion. It's a deductive argument. The cl conclusion necessarily follows. Okay, so why have I given you mathematics? And why have I given you a basic deductive argument? It's to show you that we have an ability to think and Reason, excellent. So when we say one plus one is equal to two, something is happening in our minds. Nothing is happening in the outside real world, it's happening in here, correct? When we start thinking about premise number one, whatever begins to exist as a cause, premise number two, the universe began to exist, then the conclusion, therefore the universe has a cause, that has been concluded because you've taken those two premises in your mind and you've taken them on a mental journey and you've made a conclusion. Did you do it in the real world? Where did you do it? Okay, so you have an ability to deduce, you have ability to conclude, you have ability to infer. Here's an inference for you. It might not be a strong inference, but it's an inference. So I want to find out the, the, the color of camels in Oman. I've observed 556,252 brown camels. So is it safe for me to conclude that the next camel I'm going to see is going to be brown? It might be red, because it's an inference. An inference is not as strong as a deductive argument. But is it a strong inference? Thank you, because it's probabilistic. An inference, an inductive inference is probabilistic reasoning. But I've seen over 500,000 brown camels it's quite likely the next one is going to be Okay, so you answered that way because you made something called a Inference So you've made an inference, you made a deductive argument You made a rational conclusion, you made a mathematical conclusion All of these things happened where? In the real world or in here? Okay, good, so here's my thesis And obviously in philosophy there's so much debate and discussion about this A lot of philosophical hair splitting we're not going to engage with that today, so what I'm saying to you is quite intuitive and it's rational and it's for you to continue your journey. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and talk about 
all the different theories on how it links to consciousness as well. This is this crazy debate, yeah? In academia, you know, th this happens. But let's just stick to this for now. So we have the ability to infer, the ability to deduce, the ability to, conclu to, to conclude. We have the ability to reason. Correct? Here's one more. Where am I standing? Right here? If I said to you I'm standing right here and right there at the same time, is that rational? Why? I'm very delusional, yes. But why? Yeah, but maybe I'm over there as well. Can I be two places at the same time? It's a contradiction, right? Yeah. I'm violating what law? The law of contradiction. If I said I was white and black at the same time, like it does of color, I'm neither actually, but you get the point. Would you believe me? Because if you're either white or you're black, right? In terms of color. Correct? What if I said I was a male and a female? Oh, that's a contentious issue now, isn't it? <laughs> Let's not get into that one. Yeah, but you get the point. If I said that my following words are going to be true and untrue at the same time, would you believe me? Can something be true and untrue at the same time? But that's a logical what? Contradiction. It's violating the law of non-contradiction. That's a logical principle, correct? Yeah, well, being a married bachelor. Hold on a second, a bachelor's unmarried, so how the hell are you married? That would only make sense in the Muslim world, because if you have one wife, you're technically seven, three quarters bachelor, right? <laughs> so maybe it's not a good example, Chef. <laughs> I'm only kidding. But you get the point. Can you have a married bachelor? Well, technically, a bachelor is unmarried. But if you're married, you can't be a bachelor. So to say an unmarried bachelor, just does, it's meaningless. It's logically, it's, a, it's like a logical contradiction. It's like saying someone is married and not married at the same time. Clear? Good. All of this is happening in your mind. You have an ability to reason. You understand the law of non-contradiction. You can infer. You can deduce. You could do mathematical reasoning. All of this is happening in your mind. Okay. Here's my point. Most atheists, not all of them, we have to be fair, most atheists are philosophical naturalists. They don't like the term. People don't like terms. But if the hat fits, wear it. If the imam fits, wear it, right? And what is a philosophical naturalist? It's someone who believes that there is no God. There is no divine. There is no supernatural. There is no non-physical. Everything can be explained by physical processes. That's, generally speaking, the worldview of an atheist. Some would deny it, some won't, but if you ask them simple questions, do you believe in God? They're like, no. Do you believe in the supernatural? No. Do you believe in the non-physical? No. Do you believe the world phenomena can be explained by physical processes or things? Yes. Okay, Jazakallah here, you're a philosophical naturalist, yeah? So philosophical naturalism has that perspective. There's no God. It's all physical processes. And there is no non-physical. Well, here's the point. Physical processes are blind, cold, and non-conscious under philosophical naturalism. What do we mean by blind? Nothing is directing physical processes anywhere. There's no intentional force taking them anywhere. Electrons are whizzing around. They're cold and non-conscious. What does that mean? These physical processes are not aware of themselves and not aware of anything outside of themselves. They lack intentionality. They're not about or of something. Okay. So you're trying to say to me that our ability to reason, that's happening in here, our ability to take two premises and take it to a logical conclusion, our ability to infer, our ability to do mathematical reasoning, our ability to understand and apply the law of non-contradiction, are you saying that has come from blind, cold physical processes? That's equivalent of believing something comes from nothing. Because there's no property in these physical processes that are giving you the ability to reason, to infer, to conclude in this way. It's happening in your mind. 
And by the way, you could do it with things that don't even exist. You could do it conceptually. You could do it conceptually. If I said to you, one fufula plus one fufula is equal to two fufulas. What on earth is a fufula? <laughs> but it's true. I, I haven't experienced it, but conceptually, logically, it's making sense to you in some way. If I said to you, I've observed five fufulas, yeah? I've observed five fufulas, those fufulas are zello. Therefore, the five fufulas are zello. What's zello? It's a color I've made up. It's a color I've made up. But you get it because it's the structure, the logical structure of the argument. That's why we do algebra. X is the unknown. But you make sense of it because of the logical structure. And interestingly, interestingly, in a deductive argument, the conclusion, there is a logical relation between the premises and the conclusion. So when we said, whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause, that conclusion is logically related. There is a relation between the previous statements and the conclusion. That relation is non-physical. Where is it happening in the physical world? Logical relations exist here. They don't exist there. They exist. And our mind, according to philosophical naturalists, comes from these blind, cold physical processes with no intentionality. They're not aware of themselves, aware of anything outside of themselves. There's no intentional force directing them, directing them anywhere. They're blind and cold. So how can you get something that is not blind and cold coming from something that is blind and cold. Our ability to reason is not blind and cold. We have the ability in our minds to take statements and premises and take them along a mental journey to form a conclusion. How is that the ability of a blind, cold physical process? Let me give you a very simple analogy. Two scenarios, two taxi drivers, Allahu Akbar. Let's do this. Two Omanis walk into the taxi. Assalamu alaikum. Kaifa hal. Yeah, mu akbar. <laughs> yeah. Mu ulum. Kaifa jama'a. Yeah, they greet each other. They're there for half an hour with the greetings. Yeah. <laughs> and, they're, <laughs> and they're back. They're going to the, the two, the two Omanis. Call them premise number one and premise number two. Yeah. They're in the back of the, the taxi. And he, they say to the taxi driver, Take us to Sultan Qaboos Mosque in Muscat. And the taxi driver says, no problem. But the taxi driver has a blindfold on. Starts the car. Is the car going to go to the masjid? Because the guy's blind. He's blind. Let's, let's change that same scenario. Say he's dead as well. Because he's cold. <laughs> he's dead cold. He's dead cold and he has a blindfold. Which is not needed, but let's add it for fun. So the taxi driver, blind and dead. Yeah? And then the back, can you take us to the masjid, please? And they're waiting. And Are you going to go to the masjid? Well, how do you believe that cold, blind, physical processes are going to take you to a mental, intellectual journey inside your head? How are you going to make an inference, a conclusion? How can you apply principles of logic? How can you apply reasoning skills? It's impossible. Take the second scenario. Two Omanis walking in the back. They do the half an hour greeting. The guy says, can you take us to Sultan Qaboos Masjid in Muscat? He's got bright eyes open. He's warm-blooded. He's like, Bismillah, let's do this. Is he going to go there? Khalas. That's why atheism is irrational. Because the worldview of atheists, the majority of atheists that adopt philosophical naturalism, that believe that there is no supernatural, no divine, that Everything can be explained by physical processes and physical processes are blind and cold. They have no intentional force directing them anywhere. They're not aware of themselves or aware of anything outside of themselves. They have no intentionality. They're blind and cold. How can that now explain our ability to reason? Now, how does God's existence explain our ability to reason? Well, it's very simple. Allah is al-haq. 
He's Al Alim. He is the truth. He is the knowing. He is Al Hakim. He is the wise. He created the mind. He gave us the ability to speak and articulate and have language, which is linked to reason as well in some way. That makes sense of our ability to reason because we have come from the one who is the truth, the one who is the wise, the one who is the knowing. His names and attributes and his creative agency and power completely make sense with regards to our ability to reason. Now the atheist may say, look Hamza, you're simplifying this. Yeah, Habibi, you're simplifying it. What about natural selection? You know, it's about survival and reproduction. Maybe we had conditions, biological conditions, that dictated that in order for us to survive and reproduce, we had to have cognitive faculties that had the ability to reason. Ah, we have a sticky wicket now. How are we going to answer this one? Natural selection explains it. Well, there's a few ways to undermine this. Number one, they're assuming there's a necessary link between survival and reproduction and the ability to reason. Couldn't it be the case? Couldn't it be the case that our, that our ability to reason could actually make us die and not survive? Could it be the case that our ability to not reason could lead to survival and reproduction? After all, look at cockroaches. They reproduce more than we do and they survive quite well. Apparently, if there was a nuclear holocaust, what would be running around would be a bunch of cockroaches. I don't see them in the coffee shop writing about quantum physics and writing about Rumi's poetry. You know, imagine a cockroach in the co coffee shop, you know. Just thinking about man, life, and the universe. <laughs> that would change everything about mafia movies. You know, they say, you cockroach, yeah? It would be, it would be, it would be a, uh, it won't be a blameworthy thing to say. <laughs> the point is, here's a scenario. And this scenario has been postulated by non-Muslim philosophers. Say, for example, I'm a, one of the primitive forms of a human being. I'm in a jungle. And I'm hungry, I need to survive. So what I do is I need to eat. And all, all that there is in this jungle are mushrooms. They're all mushrooms. But I adopt, I adopt the idea that Let me rephrase, the, let me rephrase the, the, the scenario. So I'm a jungle person and I basically go into the jungle and I need to survive. So I have berries and mushrooms. And I formulate the idea that all mushrooms are poisonous. All fungi are poisonous. I end up surviving, don't I? Because I start eating the berries and the berries happen to be okay. So do I survive with the idea all fungi are poisonous? Yeah, I do. I survive, don't I? I eat the berries, I don't eat the fungi. So I survive. But is the idea all fungi are poisonous, is that true? There you go. You survive with an irrational belief that was maybe formed with cognitive faculties that weren't working properly. For example, if I'm scared of a predator and my rational faculties are not working that well because I'm primitive and I hear a rustling in the bush I think it's a predator, but it's just the wind, and I run away. Do I survive? Can I end up rep reproducing? Was that rational? No, because it was just the wind, it wasn't a predator. And you have other academics and philosophers, I don't want to expand the academic debate here. I think his name is James Sage, he makes a really good point. That if you did have rational faculties to that degree, it's actually not conducive to survival reproduction, because you need a lot of sugar in order for your brain to work, for you to make these type of inferences. And it, it, it consumes your biological resources. But as a surviving creature and species, you need to preserve your resources. So there is an argument here that you can survive with cognitive faculties that are not ideal, with and with cognitive faculties that cannot 
lead to the truth and with unreliable cognitive faculties. Unreliable cognitive faculties that lead to falsehood can make you survive. So there's no necessary link between survival and truth. So it's not a strong counter argument. By the way, there's lots of philosophical debate on this. And yes, this is not a philosophy class, so I'm not going to bring everything out in there. But this is kind of the, the key argument. It's a very strong argument. So the response about natural selection simply does not work. Think about it from a social biological point of view as well. Think about how crazy human beings are. We climb mountains for God's sake. We spend years doing things that risk our lives. That's really against the whole notion of survival and production. Yeah? Like even the things that we do as human beings is quite going against the grain of that so-called survival and re reproduction. Yeah? Even from a social biological perspective or anthropological perspective, you see, you know, why, why would humans do that if we were just based on survival and reproduction? So, that's one of the counter arguments which I think is not very, very strong. Yes, there's more philosophical nuance behind that, but I leave that for your own further reading. And that's it really. Atheism is irrational from that perspective because it's basically saying that your ability to reason comes from blind, cold, physical processes. It's like saying that a blind, dead, blindfolded, dead taxi driver could take two passengers to a certain destination. But that's just impossible, as we've just mentioned. So this is why atheism is irrational. So today we talked about atheism is unnatural, which we've discussed because it goes against the self-evident truth. And we spoke about the features of a self, the features of a self-evident truth. And we talked about the underlying basic concept of a creator. And we showed that it's a self-evident truth. Therefore, the onus of proof is on the atheist. And by the way, if they deny, it, deny this and they say, oh, self-evident truths don't exist, what they're doing, they're denying reality because things that they believe to be true, like time exists, like the external world and so on and so forth, are based on self-evident truth. So they can't have their cake and eat it. And also we discussed that our ability to reason, to do mathematical reasoning, to apply the law of non-contradiction, to deduce, to infer, all of these things, we have the ability to do that. And that cannot be made sense of under a philosophical naturalistic perspective if processes are blind and cold. There's no intentional force directing them anywhere. They're not aware of themselves or aware of anything outside of themselves. They're blind and cold They're not, and non-conscious. And it's equivalent of saying that two passengers can go to a taxi, into a taxi and the taxi driver is dead, he's cold and he's blindfolded. They ain't going anywhere. But theism, Islam, the belief in God, he's al-haq, he's the truth, he's the wise, he's the knowing make sense of our ability to reason because he is the truth, he is the wise, he is the knowing and he created us with these abilities and therefore it's equivalent of the first scenario that you can have two passengers and you're warm-blooded, fully focused, seeing taxi driver that can take you to your destination and the reason I mentioned two passengers is like the two premises that we discussed you take those two premises and you lead them to a mental conclusion, a rational insight Atheism can't make sense of that, therefore atheism is irrational. And we also concluded atheism is unnatural. Now, as a concluding point, I, I truly believe that most of atheism is not really a, an intellectual exercise. Yes, there's been a lot of intellectual debate, there are lo there's lots of philosophical hair splitting, there's lots, lots of that. And look, I've studied philosophy, I'm in the academic world, I have written a book, it's about arguments, so I'm not denying that, that it doesn't have its role. But generally speaking, we need to be careful that we, that we don't overemphasize this. Because I truly believe through my experience, and my experience compared to most people is very extensive concerning dealing with atheists. And when there's been a postulation, an argument or a position about something, I would say maybe 80% of the time there's been a psychological or social issue rather than an intellectual one. And we need to be cognizant of that. Now, I'm not saying, oh, you know, atheists have trauma or they're like sick people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the denial of God is not purely motivated by intellectual reasons. Yeah? The denial of God is not purely motivated by intellectual reasons. There are psychodynamic reasons. And by the way, this doesn't mean the Muslims don't have trauma too. We do. Like the, things, the wrong things that we do in our community is not intellectual either, it's based on our own traumas and our own psycho-emotive issues. So I'm not saying it's only one group of people have these issues. 
But I'm saying the denial of God is usually because of psycho-emotive issues. You know, I mentioned this earlier today in the workshop. I had a Pakistani atheist that came up to me after a lecture at university. And he was, I think he did quantum physics. He did a master's in quantum physics. He said, Hamza, your argument doesn't make sense for God. Your argument for God's existence doesn't make sense because causality doesn't make sense outside of the universe. And I basically, you know, there's no point going into a master conversation about the nature of the causal link because there's ikhtilaf, there's difference of opinion in Western metaphysics on the nature of the causal link. So I just basically asked him, what do you mean by causality? <laughs> and you know what he said to me at the end? He basically said, I don't know. I said, hold on a second. You're giving me an argument for God's existence, uh, against God's existence. And in that argument, in that statement, using a key word, and you don't know what that key word means? So what are you saying? So had a conversation, sat him down. What did he say? I came from a secular family. I didn't know how to connect to Allah. So it was so-called intellectual, but underneath that, there was something else. By the way, this is not to belittle atheists. It's to show that human beings are fundamentally psychological. And even in cognitive science today, they argue that you may have an intellectual position, but it's also motivated by psycho-emotive, psychological driving forces. Yeah? Another example, I think I mentioned this the other day. Had someone who did the algorithm for Facebook or something, he was coding. He basically said, I don't believe in God. He believed that artificial intelligence can be fully human, fully conscious, no problem. We had a discussion. I disagreed with him. My master's was related to consciousness. Talked about the Chinese room experiment. Professor John Sell's argument, the difference between syntactical arrangements and semantics and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, then we continue the conversation. Then he basically says to me, then I ask him, look, why, why are you denying Allah? Then he says, I believe Allah has human attributes. Human attributes. Like, hold on a second, this is not Islam. There is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His name, name and attributes are perfect, maximally perfect, maximally perfect without any deficiency and flaw. And I was explaining this to him. Then I realized something. Hold on a second. There's a massive contradiction. I'm not going to let him get away with this. He was okay for the, for the AI machine that was created by the human to have the same attribute as the human, which was fully conscious, human consciousness. But when it came to God, the creator, he had a problem that the human being would have similar, inverted commas, attributes to God in his perspective. I don't agree with him. But his argument was a contradiction. And he has to understand the door swings both ways. So what that made me realize, because I don't want to be there just to debate him and prove him wrong, because hopefully Muslims should be, we should be dedicated to the well-being of other people. So I said to him, I exposed this contradiction subtly to him. And then I said, maybe there's something else going on. And I talked about my father, my experience with my dad, how that kind of, you know, my arrogance towards my dad was based on other issues and it made me affect my perspective on him. Similarly, your perspective on God could be affected because of something. I'm telling you, this guy was slim, not really tough guy, softly spoken. The minute I mention something like that, he stands up, he's crying, saying this is emotional abuse. How dare you? He's kind of shaking. I'm like, whoa, it was ilham. It was like divine revelation came down. Because for me, it was like a sign that there was something else going on. Changed the subject, bought him food. What did we find out from his mother? He said, uh, yes, he had issue with his father's uh, stepfather and his father. And now he's working on to deal with it because that is the space in which his arguments are coming from. Do you see my point? And I'm telling you, this happens a lot. And one way to understand this is forget God's existence. Say to the atheist, if Allah did exist, if the creator did exist, would you worship him? If they say no, then you know it has nothing to do with intellectual arguments. Because a lot of people just want to be masters of themselves. You have to understand that our biggest crisis is not atheism. Our biggest crisis is secularism and liberalism. It's self-worship. That's what it is. Because the liberal worldview or the secular worldview says, you own yourself. The primacy is on you. Liberalism says the primacy is on the individual. Individualism, atomism. It's you. You're a priority. You have primacy. Your individual rights. You don't have any necessary social obligations and attachments. This is the liberal worldview. This is the fundamental premise. 
So what is that going to create in someone's mind? It's my body, right? It's, my, it's me. It's my body. I could do what I want. We don't even have that narrative. Why? Because Allah owns us. Allah created us. It's an amana. It's a trust. Do you see the, what's going on here? And so liberalism and secularism will actually inevitably promote this atheistic discourse because it comes from a certain worldview. And that's why they won't want to worship Allah because they think, no, it's me. You know, it affects the ego, doesn't it? Have, you know, Allah makes it very clear. Have you not seen the one who takes his own hawa, his desires as his Lord? It happened to me when I was non-Muslim and there was a brother who used to come to the house, big beard, thobe, stuff like that, practicing brother. And I remember once he said to me, we don't do things for you. We do things for God. I went into the toilet. From what I remember, I felt a pain in my stomach. My ego really hurt. It's like, what? You don't do things for yourself? You do things for God? I just couldn't understand it then. But wallahi, that was a huge gift from Allah because it was one of the moments that allowed me to think spiritually about this profound thing about your ego and Allah. It's all about Allah, not your ego, right? That was so profound for me. Eventually, right? It took time. It's medicine. Sometimes it's painful, yeah? It's bitter. But then it starts to work. So human beings are like that. We're brought up in that kind of secular liberal atmosphere where really it's about self-worship. Self and as I said in the first lecture, we have to be a little bit more intellectually and spiritually brave and just turn the tables and say, look, human beings' default position is to worship something. Martin Ling said something very powerful. He said, man cannot not worship. Man, human beings, cannot not worship. They're always in a state of worship. And he even argues that the whole thing of modernity and by extension liberalism and secularism, all of these isms, especially postmodernism, that is a form of polytheism. Why? Because they want absolute freedom, especially the postmodernists. There's no objective method to find an objective truth. Truth is what you want based on your own understanding of language, context and history and background. It's all fluid. Therefore, if you want to be a dinosaur that is gay and lesbian and transgender all at the same time, if you identify that way, no problem. You'd be the first gay, lesbian, transgender dinosaur. Yeah? <laughs> but it's true. Okay, I know this is a bit hyperbolic, but you get the point. It's hawa. I want absolute freedom. But human beings can never be absolutely free. Absolute freedom is an aspect of divinity. So their chase for these isms and schisms is really their fitrah telling them you should be worshipping Allah, not yourself. But they create all of these forced man-made ideologies and they end up worshipping themselves. Autodeism. They worship themselves. Because they will never have absolute freedom because absolute freedom is an aspect of divinity. Allah is al-ghani, the free. As-samad, the independent, the rich. Not human beings. So their chase for this absolute freedom is really their desire for Allah. But they're lost in darkness, making up all of these ideologies. And then they end up thinking that they should be the ones who is God, who is divine. So we need to make them realize you're worshipping something. Because you remember what we said about worship in the beginning, the first lecture? Worship entails recognizing something as the ultimate truth, wanting to know something the most having full adoration for something, loving something the most, obeying and referring to something the most, directing your acts of worship to something the most, which includes praise and gratitude. That's wor worship. And if you don't believe in God, you're still worshipping something. Because is there something that you're going to recognize as the ultimate truth or something that you want to know the most at any point in your life? Yes. Is there going to be something that you love the most at any point in your life? Yes. Is this something that you're going to obey and refer to the most at any point in your life? Yes. Is this something that you're going to praise the most or show gratitude towards the most at any point in your life? Yes. That's your object of worship. And Allah sent the Quran to free them from the shackles of this worship. As Allah says in chapter 39, verse 29, consider the situation of two people. One man is a servant, a slave to many masters and they're all quarreling. And one man is a servant to one master. Whose condition is best? So really, their chase of freedom is their chase for slavery. And true liberation comes with the slavery of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and this is exactly what we need to tell people and be brave about it. And I'm telling you, sometimes I've been asked by university to give a lecture on God's existence. I've given a lecture on this existential issue about worshipping God. And I've made them realize, well, this is worship and you must be worshipping something. So the big question that you should be asking yourself, who is really worthy of worship? And when we introduce Allah and show why Allah is worthy of worship, it changes everything. So brothers and sisters, may Allah bless every single one of you. Jazakallah for your time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, very good question. So the first question is, if everything requires a cause, then what about the cause of God? Well, the, there's a problem in your question. Yeah, I, I did, I did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The problem is with the question is it's false. Because no one has ever said everything has a cause. Who said that? We said everything that begins to exist has a cause. Or anything that came into existence has a cause. Anything that is makhluk has a cause. Anything that is muhdah, came into being, has a cause. If it moves between two states, non-being and being, it requires some kind of explanation, some kind of prior causal condition, some kind of cause. It's not everything has a cause. Is that clear? Allah is the uncreated creator. So if you say, who created the uncreated creator, is a contradiction. It's like saying there is a married bachelor. So you can't apply that question to Allah because He is uncreated. Is this clear? That's the simplest way of dealing with it. Another way of dealing with it is explaining the absurdity of an infinite regress of causes. So if you're saying there is a cause or creator for the universe and now you say, well, who created that creator? Well, let's hypothetically say another creator. Okay, then who created that creator? Another creator. Okay, who created that creator? Another creator. If you carry on, on like that forever, would you ever have the universe in the first place? No, because for the universe to come into existence, there must be a forever number of causes, of causal connections to happen. But forever never ends. So therefore you will never have the universe in the first place. Since you have the universe, there must be an uncreated creator. It's like me, say I had a gun, a water gun. With Zamzam -zam water. Yeah, come on, some Hussan has done here, yeah? And I will shoot him right between the eyes. Then he won't have to wear glasses anymore. Right? But before I shoot you, bro, I need to ask the guy behind me. And then the guy behind me has to, has to ask the guy behind him. If that goes on forever, am I ever going to shoot you? Thank you very much. It has to stop somewhere. So, it has to stop somewhere where the person doesn't have to get power from something external to itself. So likewise, with this example, or with this, the, the scenario of the creator, there must be an uncreated creator. I had this very beautiful young lady come to me yesterday. She was about this high, very nice wavy curly hair. Mashallah, may Allah bless her and her family, yeah? Is that your grandma? Allah, may Allah bless your granddaughter, yeah? And, uh, oh, is she here? Okay. So basically, she asked me, you know, she asked me, who created Allah? And I was thinking in my head, what on earth am I going to say to this little girl? Do you know what I said to her? And I'm only going to mention this to you, hopefully not to show off. 
just so you could teach this to others. So I use this as an example. And I said, if this was a painting, and I showed you this is a painting, who painted the painting? A painter. Okay, I said, okay, who painted the painter? I said that to her. It doesn't apply, does it? Because the, it just, just, the question doesn't apply. Then I said, imagine this was a nice cake. Who baked this cake? A baker, right? I said, who baked the baker? <laughs> yeah? Allahu Akbar. So that was the summary of the conversation. And she got it. Because I said to her, Allah can't be created because he wasn't created. He didn't come into being. He was always there. Therefore, you don't have to ask the question. Does that make sense? She's like, yeah. Yeah? So I thought it was a very profound experience, yeah? Um, where were we? What was the question? Oh, the second question was? Okay, why can't there be more than one creator? Well, this is very simple, yeah? There's a few arguments to make, many arguments to make. One argument is a very kind of intuitive one. Well, if you had two kings of a castle, there'll be what? Chaos, right? Because they're going to be competing with one another. And if they're not competing with one another, then either one of them submits or the other submits, or they're the same will. If they're the same will, then there's only one creator. Simple way of putting it. The other way of putting it is what Al-Ghazali said, in, I think it was in his Tahafat al-Falasifah, in the incoherence of the philosophers. And he made a really powerful argument. He made an argument of what I call conceptual differentiation. I know it's a bit difficult. But say here, how many bottles do we have? You sure? How do you know? Okay. What concept is in place for you to understand there's two bottles? No, you can see it. But what do you see? What concept can you realize and see? Physical. They're in two different geographical locations. Correct? What about the amount of water? One is half, one is full, yeah? Correct? There's a distance between them. Correct? They even have different temperatures, I think. So there is something in place that allows us to understand there's multiplicity. There's more than one bottle. Okay. Now, if the if now there was no difference in space, geographical location, temperature, volume of water, size, location, it was all exactly the same. How many bottles are there? Simple. So same with the creator. When you say there's a creator of the universe and he's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, and so on and so forth, for you now to claim there's more than one, there needs to be a concept in place for you to apply to understand that there's more than one, multiplicity. What concept is that going to be? Are you going to say one is more wise than the other? Well, therefore, one is not God. Are you going to say one is more powerful than the other? Well, one is not God. What difference is there going to be? So how can you even claim multiplicity? You see the point? That's a summarized version of explaining that. Another way of explaining it is, well, we know there is a will. There is an irada, there's an uncreated will that willed the universe to come into existence. And this argument has come from the book of Aqidah Tahwiyah, one of the explanations of Aqidah Tahwiyah. And this is called the argument from exclusion, I believe. So say you have this will that willed the universe to come into existence. You have a few possible scenarios. If you claim there's more than one will, say two wills, in, in other words, two creators, then there's one possibility, and that possibility is, let's make it simple. Say they wanted to move a rock. These two divine created creators, these, create, these, these, will, create, these creators that have a will, there's two of them in this scenario, they want to move a rock. First scenario is, one wants to move it to the left, one wants to move it to the right. The first scenario is that one of them moves it to the left. How many wills are there in reality? No. There's one rock, one will wants to move it to the left, the other to the right, but the one who wants to move it to the left wins. So what has, what has been willed? The left. So there's one dominant will. So there's another will that's been dominated. Is, can that be the creator? Dominated will. Oh, good. Another scenario. They both cancel each other out. 
So they're both pushing to move it left and right. It doesn't move. How many wills have been manifested? None. But we have the universe. A will has been manifested. So it can't be that scenario. The other scenario is, they all always want to move it to the left and they always move it to the left. How many wills are there in reality? One. One will, one creator. That's another way of looking at it as well. And there's so many other different examples. Um, for you to get more details, and obviously these are the summaries. For you to get more details, download my book for free. Sapiensinstitute.org, go to books, download it for free. It's chapter 10, I believe, or 9, or 11. Yeah? Yeah, I mentioned that at the beginning. Yeah, that's what I mentioned at the beginning. There'll be, you can't have two kings of a castle, and so on and so forth. Yes, question. From Salah. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. No, I didn't. Sorry. Yes, I did. Yes, yes, yes. 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 That's a good question. It's a very good question. Look, the brief thing I would say is, sister, go to, we have a learning platform, learn.sapiensinstitute.org. We have an advanced Dawah training course called Awakening the Truth Within access that course and it tells you how to give da'wah to people. We also have a summarized version in Arabic. We have an Arabic Sapiens Institute channel. A lot of it is, tr is translated in text, but this one was in Arabic. So if you go to that channel, you will find around two, three hours of a summary of a course that teaches you how to give da'wah, okay? Yeah. Yes. 
Good question. OK, so let's go with the second question. The first question, let me think about it. You know, sometimes it's a bit immature just to answer all the questions, right? I don't have all the knowledge. And if I answer all the questions immediately, it means I'm naive. I haven't thought about them properly. So let me think about your first question. And we're in touch anyway. So we're mates, so we'll talk. So the, se yeah, so the, s the second question is that, you know, if atheism is unnatural and irrational, then why do you have the likes of Dawkins? You have like, you know, by extension, scientists, people writing books. Why haven't we been able to push back? Now, the first thing I want to say is, first and foremost, the new atheist movement it just was just loud noise. It didn't represent the majority of people. Yeah. In actual fact, you had atheists who were atheists for other reasons, such as values and the problem of evil or whatever the case may be. They didn't like the new atheists. Like Professor uh, Michael Rules, he's an atheist. He's a philosopher. He didn't like the new atheists. I think, I think he was the dean of my philosophy department at the University of London. Professor Ken James, he was a scholar of Nietzsche. He's an atheist. He didn't like the new atheists. He told me even not to interact with them. He said, talk about values. Don't deal with these people. So there was infighting. They just made a lot of noise. And because of the post 9-11 movement and they're riding, riding the wave of liberalism, it, it was just easier for them to basically start attacking you know, the Muslims and religious people. And they wrote these ridiculous books. Like, what's his name? Christopher Hitchens, who passed away with like throat cancer or something years ago. He wrote a book, God is Not Great. I'm being very honest, that's the most stupidest book that anyone could read. It's dumb. It's dumb. It's ridiculous. Even atheists today who are online, they say Christopher Hitchens was just all mouth. He was all bark and no bite. He had no substance, yeah? It was all rhetoric and they loved him, yeah? Because he, he was a rhetorician. But with all, he was a buffoon. He was an intellectual buffoon. If you write his arguments on a piece of paper, my... Eight-year-old could deal with it. My seven-year-old could deal with it when they were seven. My ten-year-old could, could answer them. It's just, it's just the, it was the, it's the era of sophistry. Articulating arguments, they may be in line with liberal and secular sensitivities. They don't have any substance, but let me just argue anyway. Like, yeah, see, there's an argument, right? Like, even today, you'd have atheists saying, well, who created God? It's the most stupidest question, right? The answer is simple, and we've already explained it. You can explain it to a six-year-old, but they think it's still a powerful argument. <laughs> Do you see my point? It's an atheist, outdated atheist cliche. So, what was my point here? I've lost myself in myself. That, yeah, so uh, the point, yeah, so they rode the, they rode the wave of liberalism and of the post-9-11 anti-terrorism, war on terror movement, and so on and so forth. And also, we have to appreciate something, that someone could be very good at science, but very bad at philosophy. Someone could be very good at biology, and very bad at uh, theology. So what Richard Dawkins has done, he used his expertise in science and biology, and he used that to try and formulate theological, philosophical arguments. He should have stayed in his lane. Because he does theology and philosophy really bad, right? So they've got away with it because people don't know better. We do live in an age of dumbing us down. People just don't literally think sometimes. It's all about movements and sophistry and how you speak. And if it just makes sense, if it's in line with my liberal or secular sensitivities, then it must be true, right? And for you to have the space to get people to think you need time with people, you need to sit down with people, people don't have time for each other anymore. And, you know, it just became an ideology in itself. But neo-atheism is dead, in my view. In the West, it's dying and it's dead. There are other things that have resurrected themselves or other things that have come into the kind of ideological domain, such as postmodernism and a form of neoliberalism and stuff. That's a challenge for the Muslim community. But in terms of new atheism, uh, it's not as big as we think. And it's died a death, or it's dying slowly. And I think Muslims should move on. Yes, we should still articulate ourselves, but many of the arguments don't hold weight anymore. And it's just, it's, a lot of it is social conformity and influence, right? 
And we have influential structures in, in societies that push certain narratives. And if someone like Dawkins is going to be aligned with that narrative, whether it's liberal, secular, or atheistic, then they're going to be promoted. And if it's aligned with people's liberal or secular sensitivities, then they're going to be pushed until someone challenges them. And the other thing is, which is very important, we, to has, we have to also empathize with the history of Europe. The Muslim world doesn't have Eurocentric baggage. And this is something very important we need to realize. And the Europeans need to realize this as well. Because sometimes there's the Euro Eurocentricity. There's the European superiority complex. I know because I'm Greek, yeah? Greeks have that. They have this superiority complex sometimes, yeah? Which is quite unjustified now. There's only about 11 million of them. And the whole of Greece is probably owned by Germany anyway now. So, <laughs> yeah. The point is... There was a European experience. So you had the 15th, 14th, 15th, 16th century. You had the Reformation. You had the religious wars, the 30-year wars, the 80-year wars, the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day. You had all of this strife in the name of religion, and maybe argue, you could argue trade laws, whatever. But you had this friction. You had the Catholic Church. One would argue they used the oppressive arm of the state to stop any ideas that was in Congress with its teachings. Yes, there may be some other nuances historically, but generally speaking, Europe was in a mess. Religious wars, they were killing each other. They were killing each other, massacres. Now what they've done, that European experience, they said, right, we need to basically liberalize or secularize, basically. Yeah? We need to divorce the church from the state. Rend on to Caesar's what is Caesar's, and rent on to God's what is God. Which is, which is blasphemous, really, because you're basically saying God can't answer your social questions. God can't deal with your deal with your society so what happened is that there was that friction and that European experience has actually been embedded in the hearts and minds of Europeans today but the thing that they've done is forced they said we've had a specific experience and they've universalized it that's why they think secularism is for everybody Oman should have it everyone should be a liberal everyone should be a secular that's why we had the problem with Qatar right they're trying to impose these so-called universal we don't have your history, my friend. We don't have your historical baggage. We don't have the friction that you have. We okay. We're all right. We're happy with our sultan. Thank you. Yeah. We don't have a friction between science and religion to that degree. Yes, there's been dark patches in our history. I don't think we should over glorify our history. Someone who over glorifies the history is a sign of a defeated mind. We need to be just and honest. But we didn't have the European history, that's for sure. Don't impose it on us. Now, understanding that discourse is important because you get to intellectually and historically empathize with them. So you know where they're coming from. And you also know what you need to do to try and change that perspective by showing to them the glory of the, the, the Islamic history or the Islamic enterprise, if you want to call it that, yeah? That we didn't really have that type of friction. Take Islamic Spain, for example. It was called paradise on earth. It was called the convivencia, the coexistence. Jews, Christian, Muslims, to the degree he had, the, he had such a harmony that the second Moses of the Jewish tradition was there. His name was Musa bin Maimun, Maimonides. He's considered the second Moses of the Jewish tradition. He wrote treaties in Arabic. You had people from different faiths looking into the interconnecting principles of nature. To the degree when the barbarous Catholics came, burning the books and doing the Inquisition, people followed them and picked up manuscripts and went to Europe and according to Professor Arnold, Thomas Arnold in his book, The Preaching of Islam, he said that was a necessary milestone. Muslim Spain was a milestone for the European Renaissance. Do you see what I'm saying here? And, what, you think this was a, a social accident? Oh, when Europe does something good, it's because of secularism and liberalism. When the Muslim world does something good, it's got nothing to do with Islam. Let's be consistent. It was because of the social, political, moral values coming from the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ. I make an argument, and maybe we could end on this. It's, I think it's a good I want to do this for Elon Musk, actually. Yeah? Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, modernity, computers artificial intelligence, complex programming, 
laptops, iPads, iPhones, the things that these Islamophobes use to degrade Islam is all because of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You take him out of the picture, you won't have it. Historically, let's work backwards. All right. So the Prophet came, 7th century. He gave us the Quran. He gave us his teachings. That developed into a society. That society spread. 80 years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we were in Multan in Pakistan and we were in Spain. Just 80 years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the death of the Prophet ﷺ was the most greatest calamity of the Ummah. Ijma'a of the ulama say this. It wasn't the ransacking of Baghdad. It was the death of our beloved Prophet ﷺ was the greatest calamity of the Ummah. And after that greatest calamity, where were we? Spain, Multan. Allahu Akbar, yeah? Spreading Islam and spreading those values. That created a social political environment. No one's going to disagree with that. That enabled the people who developed the algorithm to exist and facilitate an economic, social, and political, and intellectual environment in order for, what's his name? Al Khawarizmi. Al -khawarizmi. Khawari say it? Khawarizmi. Yeah? Al Khawarizmi. Who developed the algorithm. If you don't have the algorithm, you don't have the computer. So if you don't have Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Quran, you don't have the social, political, and so, uh, moral values implemented in society. For those people to have emerged One would argue Well if we had another society Maybe they could have emerged So what? It didn't happen though You know what? It's like saying to your mom Well another mother could have given birth to me <laughs> Mom would just slap me in the face How dare you? Right? It's a criminal saying that Oh but I could have, an I could have had another dad I could have had another mother Right? That's a, it's an ingratitude isn't it? Yeah? So the point here is This is what Islam did Right? So we need to do it with humility, do it with hikmah, wisdom, and show people we, we didn't have your terrifying experience between power and religion and so on and so forth. It was a little bit more different. So this ideology that emerged from that, it's not universal. And you can't apply it to us. Thank you very much. Yes, we can live within you, for sure. That's how dynamic the Islamic tradition is. We could live, like me, i happy to be British, born in Britain. I could live in that society, civically engage, be a compassionate human being, be loving to my fellow citizens, want the best for them, want the best for the country. That's what Islam teaches me. But it doesn't now mean I have to like swallow the whole of the secular liberal ideology. Of course not, yeah? Anyway, may Allah bless every single one of you. It's been an amazing experience the past few days. I've learned a lot about Oman and the Omani people. It will stay with me forever. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu Wow. Yes. Sorry, I need to lean. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, um, let's uh, respect this moment. Alhamdulillah, we have uh, our three sisters who want to embrace Islam. I'm just going to repeat the same things I've said before because they're true, which is, you know, this is a very special moment because when someone embraces Islam, it's like they're having a new life. Their sins are forgiven. And like the newborn babies, and all three of you are going to be better than every single person in this room because many of us have like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of sin. So you need to pray for us that God forgives us. You are in a very special position. You, this is a very beautiful sign of divine love and divine mercy. So when someone embraces Islam, in their heart they affirm with truth 